Okay, so I'll be talking about perilunate injuries, and I think it's always relevant to uh, go, uh, refresh the anatomy. Um, remember, ligaments of the wrist are static structures that guide and constrain motion of the carpus. And in the wrist, we break them down into intrinsic uh, ligaments, which are entirely within the carpus, such as the interosseous ligaments, or extrinsic ligaments, which cross a joint, either the radial carpal joint or the mid carpal joint. And when it comes to instability, malalignment does not equal instability. It's important to remember that, especially in our at least Asian American uh, cohort of patients. We often see, especially um, in female Asian Americans, congenital hyperlaxed wrists, which may appear malaligned but are completely asymptomatic. We'll often see scapulonate gapping, but uh, a completely asymptomatic patient with a normal scapulonate ligament. So instability is really an abnormal transfer of load across the carpal joint with abnormal motion and more importantly, pain. Uh, we typically use the Mayo classification of carpal instability, uh, whether it's carpal instability, is instability dissociative, referring to the proximal carpal row, non-dissociative between rows, adaptive. And in this case, what we'll be discussing is the carpal instability complex component um, uh, 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 concept, which is components of both the carpal instability dissociative and non-dissociative, i.e. the perilunate dislocation. So perilunate injuries, it's a spectrum of injury. These are typically high energy injuries in the, in the United States, many motorcycle injuries, ladders, scaffolds, things fall from a height, typically not from a uh, fall from a standing height. And it's usually forceful hyperextension with ulnar deviation and carpal supination, which leads to this injury. Mayfield initially described the progressive perilunate instability as this very uh, con con uh, continuum classically starting on the radial side at the escape lunate interval with stage one and advancing in the clockwise manner, at least in his right-sided wrist, to the capital lunate dissociation at stage two or a fracture of the capitate, stage three with an injury to the LT ligament, and stage four when there's a complete lunate dislocation. This has been widely accepted as the uh, classification scheme. We further classify these injuries as ligamentous versus bony injuries, greater arc injuries involving any fracture of any bone at any location, and lesser arc injuries being purely ligamentous injuries. So the Mayfield stage one classically is a scapulonate ligament injury or in, the, in a greater arc injury, a scapoid fracture with radioscapal capitate ligament injuries. Moving around uh, clockwise uh, with stage two, we have a rupture of the capsule through the space of Poirier, the capitate dislocation or fracture. And then stage three includes both of those injuries as well as an LTIL injury, but the lunate still remains in the lunate fossa. And lastly, with stage four, the entire carpus is forced dorsally, spontaneously reduces into the radial carpal space, and in the process forces the lunate volar through the space of foyer into the carpal tunnel. And that's the classic lunate dislocation, which we'll see. This is a commonly missed injury. Uh, it's very commonly missed in the United States in emergency rooms because people are not necessarily always uh, very facile at looking at wrist x-rays. Here's a patient with a, a fall from a ladder, contains, uh, complains of numbness and tingling, and to see the classic radiographic findings on the PA radiograph with loss of Galula's lines and the so-called PI sign where the lunate becomes triangular shaped rather than the trapezoidal shape it normally should be. And on the lateral view, you can see the spilled teacup sign or basically the lunate is now out of the lunate fossa and flexed into the carpal tunnel. This is a stage four perilunate. The reverse perilunar injuries are just the opposite. So this would start on the, la on the ulnar side and start with the lunotriquetral ligament and then pass in a counterclockwise fashion to the scapulonate side. So the initial treatment of these injuries, first we need to assess the median nerve. The median nerve is often injured, uh, contused with a neuropraxia. And then the reduction maneuver is uh, adequate conscious sedation, uh, traction to fatigue the muscles. We hyperextend the wrist, we stabilize the lunate with the thumb, and then push and gradually bring the wrist into flexion and the capitate should reduce back into the lunate. Definitive treatment would then be either uh, arthroscopic management or open reduction and stabilization. When it ta we talk about open reduction and stabilization, this could be dorsal only, which allows access to the dorsal scapulonate ligament, which we know is the most important and strongest part of the ligament. Uh, 
The Volar only approach would uh, uh, give access to the Volar LTIL, which is the strongest portion, the Volar capsule, and we can decompress the median nerve if needed, or a combined approach of both. And then the concept of arthroscopic management with reduction in pinning alone, reduction in capsulobesis, or reduction with mini open ligament repair. So just, a, I know uh, Lubo will be talking about arthroscopic management, but just a, a, a brief discussion of this. I think it's very uh, valuable for the treatment of these injuries because there's less disruption to the remaining capsular stabilizers. There's less disruption in re remaining blood supply to the ligaments that have already been stripped, less development in scar tissue, and we are able to evaluate other structures that may be injured. And this has been described by many authors, many of which are actually on this call tonight. So uh, we're very fortunate to have them uh, in the, in the uh, faculty, including our own Indoho Jian, who's, um, who is published on arthroscopically assisted treatment with no pinning. So, arth uh, uh, so I'm sorry, with no uh, ligament repair, but pinning alone. And also Min Jong Park and, other, and his group uh, also looked at arthroscopic management with reduction and pinning alone with no repair of the ligaments. Lubo will talk about his, um, his um, uh, technique as well. And um, Lubo and Guillaume Hertzberg, as shown here, provided us a, an abundant amount of wealth of knowledge in how to treat these injuries, uh, either arthroscopically or open. These are some images from uh, Lubo's paper with the surgical technique. And remember, rem uh, remembering that the lunate is the keystone to which the rest of the carpus is, is reduced. Now, the difference here is Lubo uh, advocates for ligament repairs if necessary via mini open incision. I would say that I adopt this technique. I have not uh, fully adopted the pinning only technique, although uh, the uh, papers as described before um, show uh, promising results with just pinning alone. In uh, earlier stage injuries, I have adopted Christoph Matulin's technique of dorsal capital lig ligamentous repair. Here's a, a Mayfield Warner simple scapulonate ligament injury. You can see the disruption of the scapulonate uh, space. And we place needles with a, a suture, a monofilament suture through the uh, ligament from the radial carpal portal and shuttle them to the mid carpal portal, tie them outside the body and pass the knot back into the joint. As you can see in this video. And then once that's reduced, you could see with, without uh, the ligament, you could see gapping, uh, without the uh, tension placed on the ligament there, you could see gapping at the scapulonate interval where I can insert the probe. But then once uh, tension placed on the sutures, you can see that closes up and you can see that really stabilizes it. I, I'll, I'll admit I was a little bit uh, skeptical about the power of this technique, but after doing it now several times, I, 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 I can attest to its its stability and strength. So this is a very useful arthroscopic technique to know. So you can see before and after the capsulodesis. However, for the uh, greater stage injuries, I do think that uh, there is a role for open uh, treatment. Here's a uh, stage four perilunate uh, fixed with um, a combined approach with ligament suture anchors to repair both the scapal lunate and lunar trochoidal ligament with pinning um, of all the bones uh, temporarily for about eight weeks. Stage three perilunates are always dramatic appearing, but remember as long as the lunate is within the lunate fossa, this is um, not a stage four, this is a stage three. And in this case, what we elected to do is a uh, temporary screw fixation of, uh, rather than cable wires. Um, and this is different from the RASL procedure where the screw is meant to stay in there permanently. These are meant to stay in there temporarily about three months. Um, and then they're removed. And I learned this trick from Jesse Jupiter in a group at Mass General in Boston. And the benefits of temporary screw fixation versus K-wire fixation is that you can allow these patients to start moving. I let these patients start moving uh, about two weeks after surgery. Uh, with the pins in, uh, you're not allowed, uh, you just can't move the patients early. And so this allows the carpus to maintain some motion and then the screws are removed, usually about three months after, after they're placed. And here's a patient with a typical result. Now I should say it's not, this is a relatively atypical result because most patients uh, with periluna injuries, because it's such a devastating injury, do lose some range of motion um, despite appropriate treatment. Now, what about periluna fracture dislocations? 
These are the greater arc injuries. There's a transcapoid perilunate injury. We could still uh, manage these arthroscopically. Often your first view is just a big um, uh, screen of blood. So you need to evacuate the, the hematoma. And once you've done that, then you can assess the ligaments as well as the fracture. Here we have the scope in the three, four portal. And you can see complete disruption of the ligaments uh, attachments. And there's the scapoid fracture as well. From the mid-carpal view, you can uh, remove some of the synovium. I do prefer uh, wet arthroscopy um, in certain situations, not always, uh, but uh, um, in the fracture settings, often I will use dry arthroscopy. And there you can see the, um, the fracture. We put a K-wire provisionally in the proximal pole. And then once uh, the, the K-wire is in the appropriate position, then we reduce the proximal pole to the distal pole arthroscopically. Once it's adequately reduced, then we could advance the guide wires across. Here, in this case, I used two screws to fix this fracture, um, but you can certainly just get away with one. And here's the patient three months post-op. Uh, here's another patient with a, a transcapoid perilunate. Uh, in this case, we uh, uh, fixed both the ligament and the scapoid. Here's another case, uh, a little bit more jumbled. You can see Galula's lines are much more jumbled. Uh, and this was a transcapoid transcapitate perilunate. So fixing the scapoid and the capitate in that scenario. Um, you can all have all different variants. Here's a transradial styloid perilunate with a complete uh, uh, dislocation of the lunate, uh, treated with radial styloid fixation, reducing the lunate and pinning everything. Again, the lunate being the keystone. Here's another transradial styloid perilunate. So you can see multiple different fracture patterns uh, that you often encounter. What about complications of these injuries? The earliest complication is failure to recognize the injury. Um, like we spoke about before, it's commonly missed. Median neuropathy is common. Luckily, most of these are resolved when the uh, reduction is achieved. Um, and, but if there's progressive paresthesias, even after the reduction has been performed, this requires emergent carpal tunnel release. Uh, often you'll see MRI or radiographic evidence of concern for avascular necrosis of the scapoid or lunate, but Avascular necrosis itself is relatively rare as long as the radial lunate ligaments remain intact because they will continue to provide vascularity to the lunate. But you may see transient ischemia, and this can be uh, confused with AVN and, um, uh, on the MRI. So typically conservative treatment, most of the time this results over time. Other complications, carpal instability. This is my concern with just pinning alone uh, is that potentially you could lead to uh, a downgrade or uh, carpal instability with disruption of those ligaments long-term uh, with a dissociative pattern. And you're looking at an intercarpal uh, arthrodesis or ligament reconstruction. In a non-dissociative situation, then you're looking at an intercarpal or limited radial carpal arthrodesis. And progressive arthrosis has been seen in over 50% of patients treated with, um, uh, with perilunate injuries. The late treatment for perilunates would be a proximal role carpectomy or total wrist fusion if it's missed. So to summarize, these are high energy, devastating injuries are commonly missed. So you need to scrutinize radiographs. Uh, we, should, we should all be familiar with the Mayfield classification, the spectrum of progressive instability. Uh, these patients should have urgent closure reduction and median nerve evaluation and early surgical management, whether it be arthroscopic uh, or a combined dorsal and volar approach or sole dorsal or sole volar approach to repair all injured structures. Typically, you can repair these structures if they're uh, identified within two to three months, but beyond three months, you're looking at a salvage procedure. Uh, with that, I'm happy to take any questions, um, and please use the question and answer box below, um, but um, thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm.